Okay, so let's get started. So today we're going to be talking about return-oriented exploitation, ROP. So first off, what is ROP? Um, ROP actually stands for return-oriented programming, which is an exploitation technique that's used to bypass a non-executable stack and code signing. So before we get into the details of how ROP works, um, it's important to understand uh, x86 C decal calling convention. So here we have like a typical stack um, and the corresponding source code on the right. So you have um, two stack frames um, indicated by both the green and the blue color. So um, the green the green stack frame is the caller function stack frame, and then the blue um, the blue stack frame is the callee function stack frame. So basically, in a typical um, buffer overflow attack, you would so you see uh, gets the gets function at the bottom. So gets is not a safe function to use. So in a typical buffer overflow attack, it would uh, you would smash the stack by by writing a, like twenty A's or something like that, and then the stack will look something like this. So it would overwrite the save return address here, and then that would cause the program to crash because it doesn't recognize 41, 41, 41, 41 as a valid address to return to um, when it goes back to the caller function. So this is um, so this is what the stack looks like if um, you're the you shell code to try to place it on the stack and to try to get it to execute. So you would basically overwrite the save the IP with the address of an op sled. So an op sled is basically just um, a chain of no op, no op instructions or um, 90 in hex. And basically what no op does is just that literally does nothing. It just slides down um, and executes the next instruction. So you can see like a whole bunch of knob instructions here, and then it's going to hit the evil shell code and execute the evil shell code. So that's what a typical like buffer overflow attack looks like. Um, so these are stack memory protections that prevent the aforementioned buffer flow attack from succeeding. Um, so these memory protections um, include stack canaries, um, dep slash nx, and ASLR. So a stack canary is basically a pseudo random value calculated at runtime, a copy of which is stored in the dot data section in a processes um, virtual address space, or yeah, and then um, a co another copy of the canary is stored on the stack, as you can see on the right, um, right before EVP. So if you wanted to overflow the buffer, you would have to um, overwrite the canary value in order to hit the save return address or the save EIP. And so basically this, the canary is there to verify the integrity of the stack before um, executing um, before executing code on the stack. So that's uh, that's what a stack canary is, and then um, it's implemented at the GCC level with StackGuard and SSP. So SSP also, um, in addition to adding a canary, it also rearranges the stack layout to make buffer overflows less dangerous. And then the next memory protection is DEP slash NX, and this is uh, this is this basically marks um, the stack as non-executable. And it's implemented in Linux through an ELF header called the new stack. Um, that basically tells the system how to control the stack. Um, at the kernel level, so so GNU stack stack, it's uh, it's on by default, or it has it's it's on by default in GCC versions. Um, in the latest GCC versions past 4.1. And then on the kernel level, it's implemented with PACS, which stands for page exec. 
um, ASLR, address space uh, layout randomization, is basically a system-wide implementation that uh, randomizes certain areas of memory, such as um, the executable image, um, the MAP managed heap, the stack, um, and it's it's controlled through packs, um, and also uh, so you can actually see if ASLR is turned on in your system or not, um, because if you just go here. Okay, so we can um, just read this value. So it's set to two, which means ASLR is turned on on my system. Um, you can actually disable it um, if you just change the value to like zero or something. So. And then yeah, that disables ASLR um, temporarily on your system. So going back to the PowerPoint. Um, so yeah, we covered that. So dep slash nx um, presents a problem, right? Like in a typical buffer overflow attack, you want to put shell code on the stack and you want to try to execute it. But if the stack is marked as non-executable, then that doesn't work. So how can we execute code still with uh, DEP and NX turned on? Um, so this is a diagram of a process's uh, memory space. And so what we need to do is we need to find um, an, an executable segment um, that we can um, point EIP to. So as it turns out, um, both the text segment and the memory map segment are marked as executable. So um, does anybody know what's stored in my text segment? No. It's just like the instructions for the program, right? Yeah. How are you the arguments? Not the arguments, just like the actual code of the, like if you disassemble the program, then yeah. And then, um, how about the memory mapping segments? Anybody know what's stored there? Yeah, like libraries, like libc. Yeah. So, of course, those can be executed, right? Because you want to be able to execute. If you're importing like a library, you want to be able to execute functions from that library. Um, so you you can't write to the memory mapping segment, but you can execute code from there. Um, so basically, you can redirect the IP to addresses in either of these areas to essentially perform a function call, right? So theoretically, you can execute code um, in this fashion to bypass step or NX. So that leads us to return to libc. So return to libc um, is a type of attack that uses um, what we just met the theory that we just mentioned to pass in an argument into the system. And typically what we want to pass in is a string like bin sh. This basically executes, or it gives us a shell, right? Um, so if we're able to call system and pass, the, pass bin sh as an argument to it, um, then we don't need any shell code, right? So in order to do that, we have to find three key addresses. First, we need to find the address system, and then we need to find the address of exit to exit the function cleanly, and then we need to find the address of slash bin slash sh um, in libc. So on the left side, you can see like the normal stack again, right? And then the goal of return to libc attack is to get our stack to look like the diagram on the right. So you'd overwrite the return address with um, the address of system. And then 
that basically sets up a kind of stake uh, or a fake stack frame um, in which the pointer to bin slash sh is passing as an argument to the system. And then um, after after the function call is done, it just returns to Bogus address. Um, but if you want to exit cleanly, then in place of Bogus return address, you would um, have the address of uh, exit of the exit function. So now we can talk about Rob chaining. So Rob chaining is 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 based on the same idea as return the libc, except instead of ending your your um, attack after just one function call, you want to chain together um, different function calls um, to achieve something more significant, like collectively. So basically, you want to call multiple functions instead of just one. And so to do this, so let's take a look at the code on the right. So let's say the scenario is we want to call uh, func first followed by func second. So how do we do this um, even though the main is not call to either of these functions? Well, there's still um, a guess function call, right? So we can use that to um, get a buffer over for going. And so, like we did before, we would overwrite the save return address with um, the address of func first. And then um, we can see that it takes in int y as an argument. And then so in, actually, instead of using a bogus return address, um, what we need to do is we need to somehow chain this to return to func second, right? But the problem is if we just replace the bogus return address with the address of func second, um, it's going to conflict with func second's stack frame because we want to pass in charge z and um, so what we want to do is something like this. We want to find a the address of a pop return instruction so that it pops the arguments in y off the stack um, and then returns the func second. And then we repeat the same thing with func second. Like um, we'd set the return address to pop ret again if we want to if you want to call another function after func second. So that's basically what rock chaining is like. You're, you're chaining together different function calls um, through these things called rock gadgets. So rock gadgets are basically chunks of code from executable memory regions that typically end in a return instruction. So like pop red, pop pop red, um, pop 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 red, all those are all um, just rock gadgets. So Rob gadgets basically allow us to continue our attack to chain multiple function calls together. So yeah, so as we just saw, um, def is basically useless by itself um, because you can perform attacks like return the libc or set up Rob chains to execute arbitrary code. So by itself, def is easily subverted. But what if ASLR is enabled? So if ASLR is enabled, that changes things, right? Because return to libc won't work because we need to, because system isn't located at a reliable address. Um, because if ASLR is enabled, because um, ASLR randomizes the base address of libc, right? And so the address of system changes every time, so you can't hard code the address in. Um, so there's actually two types of ASLR. There's partial ASLR, um, in which base locations for certain se segments are randomized um, each time the process is initialized. So some things are static still. And there's also um, full ASLR, in which the base locations for all the segments are randomized um, every time the process is initialized. 
so with partial ASLR, you can still kind of get away with um, doing a return style attack because um, you can just find the non-randomized memory segment, right? And then you can see if you can find anything useful there. But if, if full ASLR is enabled, then that requires either brute forcing or it requires us to somehow get a information disclosure vulnerability. Um, so basically with the information disclosure vulnerability, if we're able to leak the address of a variable, we can use relative addressing to clean other addresses. And we'll talk about this, um, this in the next slide. So the problem with ASLR is it isn't truly randomized. Um, so let me show you guys. Hopefully I'm still connected. Yeah, okay. Okay, let's use phone two, so. Can you see that? No, you guys can't. Um, well, basically it looks like this. That's not gonna help, dude. Wait. No, ASLR's turned off, isn't it? Yeah, it is, okay. So let's turn ASLR back on. Okay, so let me just copy and paste what I'm seeing here. No, that's not gonna help. Um, okay, so. Can you guys see that? Okay. So basically what I did is I um, looked at the address of libc with each um, with each initialization of the process. So as you can see, it changes every time, right? Because ASLR is enabled. But do you guys see a problem? Yeah, so it isn't completely random, right? Yeah, so it isn't um so you can see how it might be brute forcible, right? It might be plus sixteen Yeah, it's it's not brute forcible or it is brute forcible. Um so it isn't completely random. So only these bits change, right? Yeah, you only need a brute force 12 bits, right? Yeah. So that's one problem with ASLR. Um, and also, only the starting address of libc changes. Um, so if you're able to somehow get an information disclosure vulnerability and leak the address of of one function in libc you can use the offset you can use that as an anchor and use the offsets that other functions exist from that anchor to obtain the addresses of other functions so the offsets remain the same that's that's another problem with aslr um, so before we get into the demo Here's some tools that are really useful. Um, GDB, um, Peta, Peta, Bob Gadgets, then Utils. So I'm gonna do a demo now. Um, so Is that or not? 
Um, so just for the sake of the recording, I don't want to increase the text size too much. But if you guys want to like get closer to my computer, so you guys can see. Um, yeah. So this is a okay. So Vuln2 is a 32-bit binary that is a set UID binary that's owned by root. So basically what that means is every time this binary is executed, it runs with root permissions, right? And um, what we want to do, the goal of this demo is to be able to exploit this SUID binary to gain a root shell because right now we don't have root permissions, right? I shouldn't be able to read this. Yeah, permission denied. Yeah, I'm not root yet. So basically what we can do is we can first figure out, so let's plug this into GDB first. Um, we're gonna try a return ellipse attack. So do you guys remember the three things we need, the three addresses that we need to get for return ellipse? System, system, system is one. That's, that's another. Bit and SH. That's, that's right. So we need to find the address of bit and SH, the address of system, and the address of exit. So we can do that with a debugger. Well, before this, remember how I said like it's really hard if ASLR is turned on? So we're going to cheat a little bit. And we're going to turn ASLR off. <laughs> but the next exercise, we're going to turn ASLR back on. So, um, OK. So let me do this. Um, what? Is that not it? Okay, so ASL is turned off. So let's do this. Um, I'm going to set a breakpoint at the entry point. If you guys want a better look, you guys can come around the computer. But. Yeah, so let's set the breakpoint at the entry point. I'm going to run this. The GDB Peta is really useful because it's just an extension of GDB and allows us to do really cool things like if we want to, so string bin sh is um, sometimes located in libc, right? So we can actually just do this. And it tells us the address that's located at. So this is the address that bin sh is located in uh, non-randomized libc. And then we also need to find the address of the system, right? system and then this is the address of system and then exit that's the address of exit so we have all three things that we need to know right to get our uh, return to look see how it's work so we're going to try to get a shell um, so this is taking a Oh wait, before that, so we need, we need to find the offset, okay, go back to GD. So we need to find, we need to override the EIP with the address of system, right? So we need to first find, like, the, the offset that EIP exists from the beginning of um, our buffer. So, before this. Okay, so there's a crash here, right? So that indicates like there's some kind of buffer overflow vulnerability. So set breakpoint. We need to find 
the offset that the that EF is is from the beginning of the buffer. So I'm going to use a tool called Pattern Create. I'm going to generate a random uh, buffer of 200 bytes. This works, hopefully this works. Okay. Okay, we get a it crashes at this address, right, because we've overwritten the IP with this random string, and it tries to access this as an address, but that's not a valid address. So that's why we get a segmentation fault, right? So we need to find the offset of this is this from the beginning of our buffer. So again, we use, so, what's that? I don't know. So we just do, we just use another tool called pattern offset. <coughs> And that should give us the offset that, um, yeah. So it, EIP exists an offset of 19. So basically, we need to fill, we need to generate a string of 19 bytes before we can hit EIP, and then we overwrite EIP with the addresses system and stuff. So let's get those three addresses actually. actually, and then. Um, So let's try this on two. So nineteen A's until we hit EIP. And um, the address system, right? So we're gonna input this address in little Indian. Do you guys know what little Indian is? Yes, yeah, reverse, so F7 and then 4, E1. Oh, uh, backwards? Yeah, kind of. And then um, we want it to exit cleanly, so this is going to be 0, this is going to be 11, 4, 7. And then the string that we're passing into system is going to be slash bin slash sh, right? So, so 4, a six F seven um, I hope this works. <laughs> okay, yeah, so it did work. We did a root shell. Yeah. It's not your boot actually. Yeah, I'm not gonna do a cat eat C shadow for you guys. Right, <laughs> because this is going on the, this is going on YouTube. But um, yeah, I'm root, so yeah, get root privileges. Okay, um, so yeah, that's basically return the libc attack. But that's with ASLR turned off, so that's a lot easier. Um, the next demo we're gonna do is um, Robosaurus. So before we actually do that demo, there's a couple things we need to understand. So first is um, the PLT and the GOT. So PLT stands for Procedure Linkage Table, and GOT stands for Global Offset Table. The PLT is located in the text section um, of a process's memory space, and the GOT is located in the .data section. So Basically, these two data structures are used to resolve um, addresses that are loaded from um, from shared libraries. So, the first entry in the PLT is special and is used as a resolver routine. So you can see PLT zero. That's the first entry in the PLT. 
Um, and then each PLT entry contains a jump to the corresponding uh, dot entry location, um, as well as um, functions to prepare for the resolver and then the call to the resolver routine. So basically what happens is um, when you take a program and you call a function for the first time um, from like libc or something, the compiler translates that call to func at plt, um, which is the nth entry in the plt. So you can see like the arrow, right? So call, when you call func at plt, it points to the, um, the nth entry in the plt. And then from there, the next instruction in, in um, the nth entry in the plt is a jump to a corresponding entry in the got. And then from the got, it actually points back to um, the entry in the plt, and it prepares arguments for the resolver. And then after that, it jumps to the resolver routine. And then the resolver routine places an absolute address um, in the god entry for that function. So that's what happens when the function is called for the first time. Um, after the first time, after the god is populated with the absolute address that the function is located in, in libc, um, there's no need to go back to prepare resolver or to go back to resolver again. So um, after the function is called for the first time, um, the dot entry will contain the actual address that's located in, in libc. Um, so we can see that here. Um, so you can see, remember the read at plt. Um, the first thing it does is it jumps to a four, 804961c. Um, and that is the tenth entry in the PLT, as you can see on the bottom. And then, so the, the image in the middle is is a is it's basically the got entries. Um, and so, yeah, this is kind of complicated. But let's just skip this for now. Um, let's let's go ahead and do the actual demo. Let's talk about Rapisource Rex. So Rapisource Rex is a 32-bit binary that was originally um, used in Plaid CTF as a challenge a couple of years ago, um, and it was originally run as a network service. So Rapisource Rex um, presents a different challenge than we encountered in our last example. Um, specifically, it has ASLR enabled. Um, this prevents us from doing a simple, um, you know, passing uh, bin sh into system as we did in our return to libc example um, because we can't reliably predict um, the address of system. Um, and so just to make sure that ASLR is enabled, we can um, double check right here. So randomized VA space is set to a value of two. Um, and just to double check, we can do this. So as you can see, um, because ASLR is enabled, the address of libc changes with um, every run of this process, or every run of this program, excuse me. And so um, usually what I do with these binaries is I also run check sec on it. Oops, let's see, file, okay. No. Oh. Okay. So, as you can see, NX is enabled. Um, it's not, however, compiled as a position and independent executable. There's no stack canary, um, and there's no rel row. So, um, so yeah, we have to find a way to bypass the non-executable stack. And we'll do this using a rock chain. Um, but first, let's 
figure out if this binary is vulnerable to like a buffer overflow. That's usually the first thing I do when it, um, I encounter like a pawnable challenge. Um, so let's run this first, see how it reacts to different input. Um, now let's try passing in a really large value. So do pipe it in to subtract. As you can see, we get a segmentation fault um, indicating that it is indeed vulnerable to a to some kind of buffer overflow. Um, so what we want to do is find because there is a buffer overflow vulnerable vulnerability. Um, we want to find the offset that EIP exists um, from the beginning of our buffer. Uh, in order to do this, we need to be able to debug this binary. So first thing I want to do is run this as a network service. And we can easily do this with a um, bash script. So while true to attach this. So now it should be running. Now this should be running as a service on port uh, leet. So as you can see here, it is running. Um, so now we just got to debug it. So here we'll do g minus q. Um, actually, yes, yeah, let's do sudo. And we just attach um, the PID. Okay, so we have this running. So now we can figure out, so now we can use pattern create and pattern offset again um, to figure out the offset that EIP exists from the beginning of the buffer. So do this. And then let's say a buffer length of 200. Actually, yes, we need to run this as sudo. I'm not sure why, but for some reason this takes a while. I'm like, system, okay, there we go. So just plug this in. Um, let's connect to the service and pass in this. Okay, so we see in GDB that this crashed at this address. So let's figure out where exactly that is. Um, using pattern offset. Oh yes, again, I'm going to use sudo. Okay. So, pattern offset reports that the, that we get a crash at an offset of 140. Um, so now that we know that, we can start writing um, skeleton for our exploits. So let's do like exploit. Have this connect to the address and um, start making a payload. And then um, 
Actually, let's put a payload over here. Okay. Um, Okay, so let's actually let's actually take a step back. Let me clear this jump. Okay, so let's take a step back and um, let's let's sort of game plan here. So basically, um, again, as I mentioned before, ASLR is enabled, and this presents um, a couple problems. First off, we need to find the address of the system if we want to perform the same attack um, that we used in our last example. Um, remember how in our last example we were able to pass string bin sh in the system? Well, now that's not that's much more difficult to achieve if because we don't know the because system isn't at a reliable address. Um, also, um, because this was a CTF challenge, instead of passing in slash bin slash sh, um, what we want to do instead is pass in arbitrary user commands. So these user commands can be anything from like id to cat et password to cat flag. So any arbitrary you know, Linux command we want to be able to execute. Um, so how can we do this? So in order to do this, we need to be able to find a location in memory that we can store our user input string into. Um, so how can we do this? So we can actually do this using objdum to examine um, all the available headers, um, including the symbol and relocation entries. And as we can see here, we have a list of the sections. Um, and we want to find a section that we can write to. So all these um, sections, none of these are suitable candidates because they're all marked as read-only. So the only ones that we can really write to are these. Now, we also need to make sure that we have enough space in the section to store our string. Um, and most of these sections only have like eight bytes, four bytes. Um, the only ones I really see are is like dynamic. So dynamics um, can hold the size of D zero. That seems like a big enough number, but if we want to verify, we can do like um, can figure out exactly what this value is. So do D0. So that's 208 bytes. That should be more than enough space um, to store our um, user string into. So now that we know a location to write to, so we're going to write to dot .dynamic. Um, that addresses one of the aforementioned issues. Um, we still need to find the address of um, system. Um, so how can we do that? Well, as it turns out, um, if we look at the got entries for this binary, um, we can again do this using opsdom. Um, if we look at the got entries, we can see that there is an entry for read, an entry for write. Um, so First off, what do these libc functions um, actually do? Um, we can Google this. So read, as it says, um, this function reads at most length bytes from file, file descriptor and the buffer. So basically we can read some, if we make uh, the file descriptor zero, um, we can read like any um, anything from standard in into any location of our choosing. Um, now let's take a look at write. So write it says this function writes count bytes from buffer to file. So um, 
write allows us to write any if we make um, if we make file um, if we make file one we can write um, anything we can write any value to send it out um, from any buffer so um, how can we use read and write to to um, obtain the address of system? Well, as it turns out, we can actually leak the address of system using these two got entries. Um, so basically, what we can do is we can use um, the write function to write to standard out the address that's stored in reads um, got entry, the value that's stored in reads got entry. And so that will allow us to figure out the actual address that read the read function exists in libc. And then using that, um, if we can somehow figure out the offset that libc read exists from the beginning of libc, we can subtract that value uh, from the actual lib the actual address of libc um, of libc's read, and that will give us the starting address of libc. And then, if we can figure out the offset that system exists from the beginning of libc, we can add that to the result to obtain the actual address of system in libc. Okay, so to reiterate what I just said. Um, I've written the formula that should help us out. So the formula is basically the address of system is equal to the address of read in libc minus the read offset in libc plus the system offset in libc. So basically the first part of this formula, address of read in libc uh, minus libc read offset, that's the result of that is actually going to give us the starting address that libc should be at. And then if you add the offset that system is from the beginning of libc to the address to the starting address of libc, that should give us the actual address of system in libc. So we can make a note of that in our actual exploit. Um, so first off, we have to write the uh, user string to uh, dot dynamic. And then we have to Leak the address of the randomize libc, and then we need to call read again. So we need to call read to basically overwrite the pointer that's stored in reads entry in the global offset table. So call read at plt. And then after that, um, all we need to do is to call read again, which at this point, wow, should be system. Okay, so to summarize, the first part of our exploit, we need to be able to um, write any arbitrary user string to dot dynamic and then after that we need to leak the address of read in um, the randomized libc and then uh, we calculate the address of system and we send that back into the um, we send that back to the process um, through read in order to overwrite the pointer that's stored in reads entry in the global offset table. And then once we've overwritten uh, reads entry in the got, all we need to do is call read again in order to execute system. So it's actually, um, well, before we start writing the actual commands, um, one thing we have to remember is we have to link all these um, commands together. And we do that using um, our uh, ROP gadgets. So 
to do that, we're going to use a tool called Rock Gadget. Um, I think this is how you do it. So yeah, Rob Gadget gives us a list of, you know, pop, 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 ret, pop, pop, ret, um, all these Rob Gadgets to play with. So we'll be able to use these in our exploits. So first off, let's, so we've done that, okay. So we need to find the address um, that the read call exists at. So let's do that. We'll do now we have um, we'll use obj dump again. We're gonna grab for read. So this should be the address we need. And then, so the, we're gonna set the return address to um, a pop pop ret, no, no, a pop 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 ret um, address. The reason being because we have retakes in three arguments, so we need to pop those three arguments off before returning to the next function call. So we're gonna, just gonna add that here. Gonna be pop 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 red, and then we just add the arguments that we're gonna pass in the read. So the first argument is gonna be um, standard in because we want to read the user command from standard in to dot dynamic. So this is just gonna be standard in, and then. Then the next argument is going to be the address of dot dynamic. So we can double check that again um, using object dump. So dot dynamic is in this address. And then then the last argument that we're going to pass in the read is the length of the command. So that's just going to be well. Let's make let's first make um, a variable for command. So let's go up here. So this is going to be the length. So that's going to be, that should complete the first part of our exploit. And then the next part is going to be leaking the address of read and randomized libc. Okay, so to do that, we're going to need to call the write um, function. So we're going to look for that. So it looks like this is the address we'll need. So this is going to be right on location. And then we need to find, well, we can use the same pop up ret, pop up pop, pop ret um, address because write also takes in three arguments so we can use the same one we can use the same rock gadget and then the next part is going to be so we're going to print out the address of read to standard out so that's going to be a file descriptor one and then 
And then uh, the next argument is going to be um, the address of or reads entry in, in the got. That's just going to be, let's see. This, this is the address I need. And the last argument is just going to be four because that's the address, that's the length of addresses and um, and x86 32 bit binaries. So it's going to be four. Okay. And then, okay. So that completes the second part of our ROP chain. Now, the third part, we need to call read um, to overwrite the pointer stored and reads entry into the loss of table. Okay. So for this, we can use the same thing that we used before. And then yeah, we're also reading from standard in. So yeah, there's a lot of copy pasting going on here. Um, but instead of writing to dot dynamic, this part is going to be different. We're going to be writing to um, reads entry in the got. So this it should be this. It's going to try to trash the got in order to overwrite um, the pointer that's stored in reads entry. So that should be correct. And then the last argument is going to be the length. So that should be. Again, because it's we're working with a 32-bit binary, it's going to be um, four bytes. Okay, so that completes the third part of our ROP chain, and now the last part is just going to be uh, we just need to call read again, because at this point, once we call read, it's actually going to execute system instead of read. Um, so we can just copy this again. And then it doesn't really matter what we're going to use for the return address because we don't really care about exiting cleanly. At least not for this uh, CTF challenge. And then the last part is just going to be what we pass into system. So that's going to be what we stored in dot dynamics. So it should be this. Because remember, this is um, we're restoring the user string. So that's going to be the argument we pass into the system. Um, so this looks good, but our exploit isn't complete yet. We still need to calculate system, um, the the actual address of system, um, and send it back. So to do that, we need to find, so going back to the formula, so we need to find the libc read offset and also the libc system offset. So let's find the libc read offset first. So to do that, we're going to um, look through the library that uses so use object dump to grab through this library for read. It should be this one. This should be the offset that read exists from the beginning of libc. So we'll just put that here. So we have that part down. Now we just need to find um, libc system offset. So we need to do the same thing, except we need to go for system. 
So this should be the offset that we're going to use. Okay, so now that we have those two, um, those two offsets, let's construct, let's figure out what the, ad the actual addresses system is. So to do that, we're going to do this. Well, before I forget, um, after we send the payload, we still need to send the command. Okay. So after that, we need to calculate system. Okay. So first thing we need to do is get the read address. Which we should be getting um, to standard out. And then with that we're gonna do use a formula again. Do some copy pasting. Because I'm lazy. Okay. Then, um, then we're going to send the actual address of system back. So that it can be used to overwrite. Um, reads entry and the got. And then we'll probably want to um, we'll probably want to print out the result as well. Of what we get or what is returned. So let's make sure everything's okay here. So this should work. Let's just double check to make sure service is running. Which it is, and then we need to detach it from our debugger. And see if this works. And it does. Okay, so our exploit worked, and now we're able to run any arbitrary Linux commands on the target system.